whose blood stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Good morning. As we uh, get moving here this morning, it's a wonderful morning in Washington, D.C. It's not too cold, it's not too hot, and we've had a wonderful kickoff of our conference. This morning we had a number of, uh, of uh, volunteers this morning, so others may eat over at the homeless shelter. We had a, uh, a choir uh, from, from uh, Chicago and to see the homeless file in there along with a number of other sponsors of this great conference was heart filling and very spiritual and it filled the the void that many of um, our brothers and sisters that are less fortunate uh, have in their lives but this morning um, joy was in the room i want to welcome you to the 2009 congressional black caucus foundation legislative conference on behalf of the distinguished members of the board of directors of the foundation and the cbc i want to invite you um, to to take part and pay attention to this national town hall meeting entitled economic recovery and opportunity I can tell you that um, times are hard right now throughout the United States of America. And um, when we in the communities that members of the CBC represents and many of the communities that you come from, uh, we, we, there, you pick up the paper and it says that we're in a recession. But in many cases, um, there are people, white and black, living throughout um, this great country of ours that are in a depression. And I can tell you um, that your panelists today will be able to address some of those issues, those disparities, but also identify solutions that have already been implemented and those solutions that are in the process of being implemented. We had a wonderful discussion yesterday on poverty. And I can tell you um, in that discussion we had uh, a number of dynamic leaders that addressed the crowd to share with them that not only is help on the way, but help is already in the pipeline. And so as we talk about and we learn from one another during this annual legislative conference of how we can use the tools um, that are in our toolbox to bring about change, need it be in your neighborhood, if you're a, a representative of a non-for-profit organization or um, you're a local elected official that's trying to figure out better ways to represent your constituents but also bring about the kind of action leveraging federal assistance or state assistance or you're an individual, you're a foot soldier that's saying that I'm here to gather information and take back to my community or take back to my state and make us stronger. We know that there's great leadership not only in the White House with President Barack Obama, um, who has lived the life of a community organizer and someone that understands that it's all about economics. 
and that it's all about breaking the chain of disparities and also breaking the chains of poverty. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to hear from Majority Leader Reid of the United States Senate. Also, we had an opportunity to hear from the Majority Leader in the U.S. House of Representatives, Jenny Hoyer. And yesterday, we had an opportunity to hear from the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives in, the, in, our, in our, um, our workshop on, on poverty. But this morning, we have the distinct pleasure because she is so committed to making sure that we have a strong economy with ushering through the recovery package um, that was led by the president and was demanded by the people of the United States of America. It took great courage um, for our leader in the House to corral the various caucuses and talk with our Republican colleagues and give us not only vision but strength that we can save the jobs of police officers and, and firefighters and teachers and those that punch in and punch out every day, that we can give tax cuts to everyday working Americans, which a lot of people do not know. Forty percent of that recovery package is tax cuts for everyday individual Americans. And when you look at your pay stub, you will see it if you compare it to one before the Recovery Act was deployed. Knowing what it means, how we have to rebuild communities and put people to work, ushered through um, the Congress a, 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 a green initiative. When we look at how we not only burn energy, but how we create energy and how we create green jobs that is in the process of of, of, of employing a number of Americans. And right now, as we speak, the speaker has taken time of her schedule in the middle of the battle, in the middle of the battle for health care for all here in the United States that will affect every American and it will affect every small business and that would allow our children to be healthier, allow our society to be healthier, will drop your insurance costs of what you're spending right now. And she is leading the ban as it relates to the public option of making sure that every American is able to have quality insurance. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, Speaker Nancy Pelosi from the great state of California. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much, Kendrick Meek, for your extraordinary leadership, for being a voice for a new generation of leadership in the Congress of the United States as you chair the Congressional Black Caucus Institute. I congratulate you and Barbara Lee, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, again, for your leadership. I also want to mention uh, the, how impressed I am by the the program that has been put together by Chaka Fatah of Pennsylvania and Yvette Clark of New York, the co-chairs of this town hall and of the, the few days proceedings. Yesterday, as was mentioned, I had the opportunity to speak to a welcoming session. So I'll be very brief today uh, to accept to congratulate you on what you are doing and to say how in the lead you are on how we go forward and how the agenda set forth by President Barack Obama is very consistent with the work that you have gathered uh, to do in these few days. In his budget, which was approved on the same day in the House and the Senate on the 100th day of President Obama's presidency, the President put forth a statement of national values about what is important to our country is how we allocate and budget our resources. And his three principles for job creation and turning the economy around were investments in education, investments in health care for all, and investments in new green technologies for new clean jobs in our inner cities and rural America and across, across the country. In terms of education, I'm pleased to say we've already passed the bill the President was talking about. 
Last Wednesday or Thursday, the Congress, the House of Representatives passed a bill that not only made the most significant investments in history and education from the earliest childhood to high, a higher education and lifetime learning, but it gave $10 billion back to the Treasury. It saved money. Not only was it paid for, but it saved money by realigning priorities. <laughs> what I want you to remember about that is that in that bill was two and a half billion, with a B, billion dollars for minority serving higher institutions of learning. Historically black colleges and there, those institutions that serve minorities. That's important because the investments that will be made in, in program and infrastructure will enable those institutions to attract the, uh, the research funds. It just opens all kinds of doors of opportunity. On health care, the president principal and that pillar said that health care is a right, not a privilege. We must have health care for all, just as we must have educational opportunity for all in our country. And as Mr. Meek said, we see that root, a root to that being through having a public option to have more competition, lower cost, higher quality, and as we address the disparities in health care in our country disparities that are ethnic or racial. We don't want any disparities in it. It's for all, without discrimination, of the highest quality. Those investments are made by taxpayers' dollars. They belong to each and every one of you. The results of it do. Third, in terms of energy and climate change, the House has already passed our bill. I was reading in the paper this morning that Spain's answer to changing the reception, recession and turning it around was investments in new green technology and clean energy jobs across that country and across Europe. So too are we in the lead on that in our country. And many people in the African American community have taken the lead knowing that we need environmental justice when we're talking about energy, about where we put power plants and how we give opportunity. So the president's three pillars fit very comfortably, and of course they, his, his, his uh, pillars are about creating jobs, lowering taxes, reducing the deficit. That there's a recognition that the leverage has changed. This isn't about policies that support the one or two wealthy percent of the wealthiest people in America. This is about what we pledge to the flag, liberty and justice for all. Economic, social, and, and political liberty and justice for all. So I so congratulate the organizers, Chaka Fatah and, and um, Yvette Clark, as well as Mr. Meek and Congresswoman Lee, for making this program so substantive, so practical, so serviceable that, that in terms of small businesses and educational institutions, every place that opportunity has, has a, a, a window, uh, that that window is open very, very wide. So on behalf of the Congress of the United States, I'm pleased to be part of the welcome to this important town meeting. I was honored to be part of the opening session of the whole conference yesterday. Uh, we look forward to hearing the results of your deliberation. Know your power. What you say is important to us because this community is in the lead. You see the needs very clearly. You know where the opportunity has been lacking in the past. But again, a new day has dawned and under the leadership of President Barack Obama and with our Democratic Congress hoping to work in a bipartisan way. Uh, what our three pillars are founded uh, on the most possible opportunity. We know that the policies of the past did not work. They took us into recession. We know that investments in education and job creation and healthcare for all, which is a job creator too, for all, 
will not only lift up this community, but reverse the recession that the entire country is experience, experience and take our country in a new direction. Thank you for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Congratulations to the National Town Hall meeting, economic recovery and opportunity. Best wishes in your deliberation. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Welcome to our Economic Recovery and Opportunity Town Meeting. Let me just first uh, thank you so much for being here. We need your voice. We have to speak with one voice as we move to implement our agenda of change. And I want to take a moment to thank our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, for being here, for supporting uh, our weekend, but also for supporting all of the legislative initiatives presented and moved forward by the Congressional Black Caucus. She is uh, the greatest speaker ever. I continue to say that. Give Speaker Pelosi another round of applause. And let me take a moment to acknowledge and, and salute uh, the chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, uh, Congressman Kendrick Meek. His leadership has taken our foundation to the next level. He's doing a phenomenal job. He is an individual who has a vision but who kn knows how to put it all together. Thank you, Chairman Me. Also, uh, you know, and you'll hear from them in a few minutes, our co-chairs for this weekend, Congressman Shaka Fatah, Congresswoman Yvette Clark. They have done a magnificent job. They have been organized, they have a vision, they put together this agenda, they have not missed a beat. Give them a round of applause because they have made sure that this weekend is a weekend that you'll always remember and that you will be able to go back to your communities with information and with really some assistance in how to begin to, to mobilize and, and engage our communities in an even more active way. Uh, to Dr. Scott, Executive Director of the CBCF Foundation and the entire staff, again, they work year-round, day and night, to help put this great event together. So I want to also acknowledge uh, Dr. Scott and the staff of the Foundation. So give them another round of applause. And yes, I am humbled and honored to chair the Congressional Black Caucus. There are 42 brilliant members of the Congressional Black Caucus, which consistently and has historically been known as the conscience of the Congress. I tell you, the Congressional Black Caucus, along with our great President Barack Obama, when you look at the agenda, it is an agenda of change. Members of the CBC continue to work consistently to advance legislation that will create pathways out of poverty, stabilize our fragile economy, and present real opportunities for all. While promoting educational reinvestment in our communities, we continue to work to increase economic security, eliminate health disparities, and of course, we're working so hard with our Attorney General to repeal the mandatory minimum sentences and to really do some real criminal justice reform so that we can put our resources on the front end, on prevention, building schools, rather than on the back end, building prisons. We're working day and night on that. Providing equitable housing options. Uh, we're tackling the foreclosure crisis in a big way. Strengthening civil rights and judicial reform, addressing global poverty. I could go on and on and on. And of course, ending the war in Iraq, ending the war, a trillion dollars. A trillion dollars has gone into fighting a war that should not have been fought. A trillion dollars could be used in our communities. Could be used in our communities to build better schools, better schools, senior housing, job opportunities. So the CBC has authored meaningful legislation reflective of the need to ensure that African American communities, communities of color, communities that have been disenfranchised, our voices, our agenda, we've worked to make sure that they're placed at the forefront of the federal agenda and as well as putting forth strategies to make sure that the action plan is implemented. And we're fortunate and we're blessed to amass now a significant amount of power and influence. 
When you look at, we have our whip, Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina. He is the majority whip, the third highest office in Congress. The third highest office. He counts the votes to make sure that our agenda moves forward. Additionally, we have four full committee chairs from the CBC, Congressman John Conyers of Michigan, chair of the Judiciary Committee, Congressman Charlie Rangel of New York, chair of Ways and Means Committee, Congressman Benny Thompson of Mississippi, chair of Homeland Security, and Congressman Ed Towns of New York, chair of Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Eighteen members chair pivotal, pivotal subcommittees. Yeah, give all of our members a round of applause because they're working right now on their committees and they'll be with you a little lady later but let me tell you our caucus has a wealth of leadership and expertise and seniority and continues to be as i said earlier the conscience of the congress coupled with our, our very focused legislative agendas the CBC task forces, which range from defense and homeland security to energy and international relations, we continue to serve as a direct action agent and agenda. And we have formed coalitions that really provide the vehicle for the voices of our 40 million constituents. And we know the change that we desperately need uh, cannot and it will not occur in isolation. So we hope that this weekend you will get more engaged and we encourage you to visit our website. And let me give that to you very quickly. It's www.thecongressionalblackcaucus.com. Please stay in touch with us. Please organize, please energize and mobilize our communities around the country because you're very privileged and blessed to be here this weekend and we're so excited about that. But you know, when we go home, there's a lot of work we have to do. And so we have to let this message of this weekend get back out into the grassroots of our country. Finally, let me just uh, ask you, as Speaker Pelosi mentioned earlier, and Congressman Meek, to please get, if you're not engaged in this comprehensive health care reform debate, do that. Go home and have some town meetings. Talk to the faith community. Health care, as Senator Kennedy said, should not be a privilege, which it is in our country right now. It should be a basic human right. It should be. No one knows that better than the African American community. It's a moral imperative that we pass this. And we have to pass it with a robust public health option provision. Remember that, it's gotta have that in the bill. And so help us get that passed because this is central to President Obama's agenda. It's key to the Congressional Black Caucus's agenda, and it really is about life and death. We know in the black community that health disparities have created havoc in our lives, and it's about time we begin to close those disparities. We can do that if we pass health care reform. So once again, let me just say to Congressman Meek and to Dr. Scott, all of the ALC staff, our co-chairs this year, they have just shouldered an awesome task of balancing really the necessity this weekend for meaningful dialogue, but with also the deliberate urgency of direct and swift action. And that's what this is about. So thank you again for being here. Hopefully you'll get what you need to go back home and to begin to reinvest, rebuild, and renew our spirits so they can re really move forward and make the change that we all know needs to happen and needs to happen now. Thank you and God bless you. Good morning. I bring you greetings from the Congressional Black Caucus spouses. We are an able body of 27 men and women who not only love and support our spouses, but espouse the tenets of the American dream as well. Therefore, the spouses are honored to work in partnership with the CBC and the Congressional Black Caucus to build coalitions and strengthen the efforts to construct a more perfect union. This year's conference reflects both the depth and determination of pioneering leaders to address the severe deficits facing our communities across the country with deliberate and expedient actions. It signals a shift from the margins to the mainstream from the problems to the promise, from despair to hope. On behalf of the spouses, 
we want to render our appreciation to the CBC Foundation, its staff, and each one of you. Your commitment has truly made a difference to those we try to serve. It has made a difference to those we are trying to build a future for. And it has made it possible for us to have a pipeline of young leaders coming behind all of them. Before I move forward, let me invite each and every one of you to join us at what we call the Spouses Tribute to Progress this year. It's a new take on our fashion show. Uh, it is a highlight because what we are trying to do is raise increased funds for our scholarship programs. It's called a Tribute to Progress because there are going to be many things going on at the Metro Center at Macy's Friday evening. And we invite each one of you to come. Uptown Magazine will bring alive their men's fashion pages. There will be men's consultants discussing men's skin care. There will be a tribute to the late uh, Naomi Sims. There will be uh, what we are calling a runway to reality fashion show. That's fashions for everyday people, beautiful fashions at reasonable costs. There will be a civil rights walk throughout the store. There will be an art gallery showing the NAACP's uh, photos over the last 100 years. And Julian Bond will join us to sign autographs of the 100th anniversary book of the NAACP. We hope that all of you will come and support it. Um, again, it's not really about just showcasing ourselves, but it is about raising funds for those people we'd like to help continue their education. Throughout my chair as tenure, excuse me, throughout my tenure as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus Spouses, it has been my honor to work with the CBC and the CBCF to ensure that we can do more. No one has been a greater partner in that work than the president of the CBCF, Dr. Elsie Scott. She is a true scholar, a proved advocate, a studied strategist, and if you would, please welcome the Honorable Dr. Elsie Scott. I want to thank Simone Meeks, the chair of our Spouses Program, for that wonderful introduction, as well as all the work that she has done to forge, I think, the strongest partnership we've ever had between the spouses and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. I would like to welcome you on behalf of the board and the staff of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, welcome you to the 39th Annual Conference. We are so pleased that you have chosen to join us this year. As we started planning this conference, many people were saying that, you know, we're in rough economic times, you won't see a lot of people here. But we are happy that you came and we think we're going to have a big turnout and we're looking forward to it. We have planned a lot of activities for you. We have a big exhibit area which will be opening right after this session and we urge you to go and visit our exhibitors and partake of what they are offering. We also have a number of issue forums, brain trusts and other special events that we sure will satisfy everybody, no matter what your research area, no matter what your activism area, no matter what your interests are, that we have topics covering everything from economic recovery to health care to relationships. Anything you're looking for, we'll have it here. Anything that's related to the African American community. I would also like to thank our co-chairs, Congressman Shaka Fatah from Pennsylvania, and Congresswoman Yvette Clark from New York. They have been very helpful and their staffs have been very helpful in helping us plan the conference. And of course, this conference could not be successful without a very supportive staff. So I always say that the CBCF staff is the hardest working staff that I've ever worked with. So I would just like to thank the staff of the CBCF for all that they do. One of the programs at the foundation that we are most proud of is our fellowship program. Our fellowship program is preparing the next generation of African-American leaders 
Please join me in recognizing the 2009 Class of Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellows. Our first fellow I would like to introduce is Aaron Ampa. Aaron has a bachelor's degree from the State University of New York at Albany and a master's degree from NYU. <laughs> Stephanie Madden, a bachelor's degree from Hampton, a master's degree from the University of Delaware, and a law degree from Howard University. <laughs> Tia Tebout has a master's in education from Pace, Pace University. Last year, she served as a fellow in Congressman Donald Payne's office. Chris Scott holds a master's degree from Oregon State University, and last year he served in the office of Congressman Bobby Scott. Troy Ware is a veteran of the Iraq War. He graduated from the University of San Francisco. University of San Francisco Law School, and he worked in Congressman Al C. Hastings' office. Now we have our Lewis Stokes Urban Policy Fellows who concentrate in the area of public health. Julia Elam has a, a master's in public health from Yale University and a law degree from Vanderbilt. Camille Seeley has a master's in public health from Emory University and a master's in education from St. Joseph's. And Jerrica Mathis has a bachelor's degree from Georgia Southern, Southern and a master's of science and education from Virginia Tech. These young people will be, will be already assigned to work on Capitol Hill and they will be placed in, or they are placed in professional uh, positions, and they are helping us to increase the number of professional staff, minority professional staff, on the Hill. So welcome, and we are very proud of them. We would not be able to put on this conference and offer all of the activities that we do without great sponsors. And so it is now my pleasure to introduce our sponsor for the town hall this morning, Toyota. Toyota has been a good sponsor to us, and in fact this year they have really increased their level of sponsorship. So we are very pleased at this time to invite to the stage the Vice President of Toyota Division, Ed Colon. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good morning. And uh, let me say the first thing uh, is today's town hall meeting, I think, on the economy uh, really could not have come at a better time. And I think uh, it seems like town hall meetings have been in the news a lot lately, haven't they? Um, I, I think we're, we're all very familiar with uh, today's financial challenges, uh, which is why uh, today's discussion is very important. The Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has put together an outstanding group of corporate and congressional leaders to discuss the issues this morning. Now, I'm sure we're going to have a dynamic and discussion this morning, not only about the challenges, uh, but also about the opportunities to be successful in today's economic climate. At Toyota, we continue to believe that the well-being of our economy and that of the U.S. auto industry is essential to sustainable recovery. So, on behalf of our 36,000 U.S. employees, Toyota is pleased to be the sponsor of today's meeting. Thank you very much and enjoy your morning. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome ALC co-chairs, the Honorable Yvette Clark of Brooklyn, New York, and the Honorable Shaka Fatah of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Well, on behalf of my co-chair, Congresswoman Clark, I am Shaka Fatam, the congressman from the second district of Pennsylvania. And this morning, we have gathered here, and this is, so no one is mistaken, this is the, this is the claims counter. This is not the complaint window. We come to claim the victory that we're going to move this recovery forward, but we're going to include in this recovery communities that have been in recession a little bit longer than just the last year. So this is about economic opportunity. It's about making sure that in each of our communities, we understand the more than 100 funding programs in the recovery bill and that we are taking every opportunity to take advantage of these job training dollars, these housing dollars, these green, uh, greening um, programs in terms of new energy, that we're taking advantage of the education and the nutrition programs. We have a new president of the United States, and we have a new attitude. So this morning, I want to welcome you. We're going to get to work now. I want to bring forward our and introduce to you our moderators for this national town meeting. First and foremost, I want to introduce the NBC 10 anchor from Philadelphia. She's a member of the New York Bar. She is a beautiful and brilliant woman and the mother of my children. Renee Chanoff Fatah, and she'll be joined in this task by the very capable Ed Gordon, who really was the face of BET News, their lead news anchor. He now hosts Our World with Black Enterprise. Ed Gordon is a great newscaster and someone whose commitment to our community and our concerns has been obvious and extraordinary over many years. So we want you to fully engage. We have a great group of distinguished scholars and business leaders, nonprofit leaders. You're going to hear from policymakers and some of the key, the key decision makers in the administration and in Congress that are pushing forward these efforts. And as we begin early this morning, you should understand that we are at the very beginning of eight years, I, I'm claiming the victory, eight years of this administration in which we will have the opportunity if we, if we run and not grow weary, if we don't uh, faint, if we keep our eyes on the prize, we will have the opportunity to bring real economic recovery to communities who for far too long have been in the shadows of the economic opportunities in this land. So welcome and good morning. Renee Chanel Fatah and Ed Gordon. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. There you go. Now we're going to get started. Congresswoman Clark and my husband, Congressman Fatah, and their staff, and of course the staff of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, they have worked diligently. I've been a first-hand witness to this over the past year to make this a dynamic weekend. And I think our national town hall meeting is a perfect kickoff for that. I am honored to be here. I'm excited to be standing next to my colleague here, Ed Gordon, who I've long admired in his journalism. 
Now, I am going to shortly, because we have a lot of ground to cover. We have some 15 panelists, 10 topics, and less than two hours to do it in. So we are going to get started very quickly. I'm going to introduce the members of the panel for the first discussion, which is comprised of corporate leaders who will be talking about the opportunities as well as the challenges in this current economy. Before we do that, Ed is going to give you sort of an overview on the program as well as the information in your booklets. And in fact, I won't bore you with the information in your booklet as you can read that uh, they were placed on your seat. So when you have an opportunity, just leaf through it and you'll get a sense of uh, what in fact is going on with each one of the panelists so we won't give you a long read of their bios. And we'll give you a sense of not only what should be happening legislatively uh, by means of the people who will come on during my panel, which is panel two, but you'll also get a sense of the environment of uh, the economy because as we know, we can talk about all of the health care plans we want to. We can talk about all of the foreign policy that we want to. But coming from Detroit, I know firsthand life is really about jobs, jobs, jobs. And when you are secure, you can make your environment secure. And that is much of what we'll be talking about today. And it'll be a good opportunity to hear firsthand from people who are, in fact, um, putting their finger in the pie, so to speak, to make things happen. So it should be a good and uh, energetic discussion. We're glad uh, that you are here this morning. And with that said, let's get going with the program. Our first panel. Thank you, Ed. You Ed will be back shortly. Our first panel, which is corporate leaders discussing the opportunities and the challenges in this current economic climate. John Hope Bryant from Operation Hope. Oh, actually, if you could hold your applause, again, because we're trying to cover so much ground in a short period of time, if you could hold your applause until after I've introduced all of our panelists, we'd certainly appreciate it. John Hope Bryant, Operation Hope. George Burrell, PRWT Services. Jonathan Rogers, TV One. Dr. Julianne Malveaux, Bennett College. Carol Brown, Siebert, Branford, and Shank and Harvey Lawrence, Brownsville Community Development Corporation. Now you can apply. <laughs> you can be seated. Obviously, we have gathered here today to talk about the opportunities and the challenges that are existing in this current economic climate. The Obama administration's Economic Recovery Act is kicking into high gear, and I don't think anybody doubts that we are eventually going to see an economic recovery. The concern, the focus is, when that recovery happens, are the communities, our communities, which actually have been in recession long before it hit the general populace, whether those communities are going to be part of this economic recovery, whether it will be a sustainable recovery for everyone. John Hope Bryant, who is on the front lines of that battle, I'd like to ask you the first question. As President and CEO of Operation Hope and the Hope Global Initiative, over the past decade, we have seen dozens of sector and intermediary projects pop up. Their funding coming from public-private sources. But in light of the current economic recession, how can these projects be sustained? John. Um, well, we've, let, me, let me start by saying this is not a recession. Uh, this is a reset. And anybody who believes that prosperity is coming back, the way in which we experienced it five years ago uh, is, is, uh, is, on, is on medication. Uh, it'll, prosperity will come back, but it'll look different, it'll feel different, it'll take different skills, it'll require a different uh, fo focus and priority. The good news is that black Americans, we've been doing so much with so little for so long, we can almost do anything with nothing. And, and so you have to, you, the first thing you have to do is, is that you have to have a new attitude. Not cop an attitude, have a new attitude. And that attitude is that success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And if you can, if you can look at it that way, uh, well, the suit that I'm wearing right now is made by an Operation Hope success story. 
Um, the shirt that I'm wearing is made by an Operation Hope success story. Uh, it's Drobe Clothing. He came to, to Operation Hope because he couldn't find traditional funding. Uh, he thought his problem was money. Everybody thinks their problem is money. And I know it feels that way, but it's not. We can hopefully get in a deeper conversation. Anyway, the short version is he came to us with a $10,000 loan, wouldn't listen. So it's a free country, gave him the loan. He promptly screwed it up. Uh, we said, he came back and said, I need another loan. I said, you got to pay the first one back. But this time you need some financial literacy training, understand the language of money. You need entrepreneurship training. He went through that for 18 months. Then we gave him the loan at the end. So we approved him day one, subject to the resolution of his primary denial factors. $35,000 loan, paid the first loan back. Make a long story short, he's doing $800,000 a year today, has six employees, raising his children, paying his taxes, uh, and has started his own nonprofit in South Central LA uh, to teach young people how to become entrepreneurs and become self-employment projects. The, the, the concept that we're gonna go get corporate jobs, that that's gonna set us free going forward is a fantasy. Uh, we're gonna lose 50 million jobs globally in this crisis. That's a conservative. We've already lost 30 million jobs in China alone. You need 100 million jobs in the Middle East over the next dozen years just to keep that population stabilized. So the only thing that makes sense for us in an environment where they're decreasing jobs, uh, in my opinion, is to create a generation of black and brown entrepreneurs, uh, a generation of self-employment projects, and we can do it. Uh, and so uh, that, to me, is the new vision. And every big business started as a small business, so we, I mean, you know, Bill, Microsoft was once Bill Gates in a garage with an idea. Entrepreneurship, and we certainly want to talk about that. But let me have George Burrell, my fellow Philadelphian, weigh in on this. George is the corporate counsel, the general counsel, as well as vice president of PRWT, which is one of the fastest growing minority businesses in the country. George, not only respond to what John has said, but talk a little bit about, because I believe you do see it as a recession that we will pull out of, and sort of how has the recession not only impacted minority businesses like yours, but also what is in this current Economic Recovery Act which, which can benefit businesses well, similar before, to yours? Before George responds, let me clarify. I, I do believe there will be a recovery. There'll be, a, there'll be a, actually a surge, but all I'm saying is it's a reset. We're a in a reset. different era. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I think that what's important is that there are two sectors who are impacted by what the government does and what the government can do. And there is a sector that are small, disadvantaged businesses. SBA got $730 plus million dollars uh, in the Recovery Act that will be able to increase the percentage of guarantees on loans, hopefully, uh, will the, the government has gotten to, into the secondary market, hopefully freeing up money. But that money is available to small businesses in America. For companies like ours, which have grown beyond the size limits, and for many companies that grow beyond the size limits, you, co you compete in the, in the regular routine marketplace. And I think that uh, there are some important lessons uh, that we've learned, and I think that we, we followed at PRWT in a recessionary period that are important for entrepreneurs, and that is, in a time like this, you've got to protect your base. Make sure you don't lose the customers that you have. Make sure you don't lose the strategic partnerships and relationships that you have. And then an understanding of if you're going to get into uh, the entrepreneurial space, you have to understand what it takes. We all understand uh, that, there that there's discrimination in the world that makes it more difficult for us as African Americans and African American entrepreneurs, but you can do one of two things. You can use that as a crutch or accept it as a reality and figure out how do I get past it. And one of the ways that you get past it as a business is understand that whether you're an SBA firm going for a loan that could be guaranteed or whether you're PRWT going in on your own credit and responsibility to get a loan, that you're gonna be subject to the same due diligence that everybody else is. They're gonna to wanna to come in understand that you've got a corporate structure in place that really understands what it's doing, understand that you've figured out, and this is a challenge for many of us, us as entrepreneurs, depending upon what your mission is, uh, that you've decided that you wanna be a real business as opposed to a lifestyle business, so that you keep good records, you have strong financial statements that people can look at, and that we have to accept the responsibility. Uh, we, we uh, uh, commend our leaders and the Congress and the work that they've done to put in place programs, 
but those programs don't work unless we understand the rules, we get together, go out and pursue things aggressively, and then we do what we need to do to be successful. And then what I think is equally important, and one of the things important in this economy, is that we figure out how to help one another. At PRWT, we, are, we make a very conscious effort that to retain uh, minority lawyers and minority accountants, and when we can't retain minority lawyers and accountants for specific work, we will go into law firms through minority partners so they get the economic benefit. We have to learn how to circulate that dollar within our community. Uh, and I think there are companies like uh, PRWT that evidence that, that it's, it's capable of being done. We've been successful at it, but we face every single day the same challenges, the same higher barriers that everybody else does, but you just got to work harder to get over those barriers. John Hope Bryant speaks a great deal through your organization, um, Operation Hope, about financial literacy. And I heard you in your initial comments making reference to that. I would like to ask Jonathan Rogers, who is the president and CEO of TV One, and also in a former life, one of my bosses when we were, when we were at CVS together. What is the role of the media in aiding in financial literacy. I mean, Congress can do so many things in terms of providing SBAs, but if people don't take advantage of it, they can provide tax, tax credits, but if students don't take advantage of it to go to school, it's all for naught. What, what role does media play in, in, in addressing that? I, I would think that we play a great role in that. Unfortunately, it's not true. So let me just sort of shift this, because I agree with what uh, Congressman Fatah said, that, you know, as far as African Americans go, the recession has existed for quite a while. So when we started TV one six years ago, our main purpose was to value the African American consumer, which not, meant just not for us, but to go to Madison Avenue, to go to the large corporations, to go to the, the consumer goods companies, and value the African American consumer because we have been, for 400 years, taken for granted. Now, interestingly enough, here comes a recession. <coughs> how, how do you grow? Bless major, you. <laughs> thank you. How do you grow a major corporation? The fact is you now have to focus on the mid-tier and the low-tier of products. Who occupies great portions of that space? We do. So all of a sudden it becomes important what we think, how we act, how we live our lives. So what we've done to turn this around is, is lead with our spending power to lead with our choices, to lead with our influence on the culture. And interestingly enough, things are turning around and they're getting the message. I happen to be on the board of, of two Fortune 500 companies, and I know for a fact both of them have invested more in the African American consumer, more in research about who we are, because that in fact is the growth area. We are the growth area. Now to go back to your original question, I really wish I could put on a TV show or a radio show or an online show that talked about financial literacy and people would come to it in droves. Uh, they won't, unfortunately, and I think you know that, being a news person, how difficult it is to get people to watch serious news versus light fluffy news. I think the best answer to that would be, in fact, on online platforms. The digital divide no longer exists. We have 20 million African Americans who, in their homes, have addressable internet. I think it ought to be there, ought to be there available, and your company certainly can, can do things like this, is make it available so that you could just push a button and get all these hints and clues about how to be an entrepreneur, how to start your own business, how to adapt financial literacy. Okay. okay, I want Harvey Lawrence to weigh in because we're talking about the communities that, that are being served, but I see that John Bryan has a response, I would imagine, to what uh, Jonathan Rogers said in terms of whether or not we can get people to, uh, to watch the programming. Yeah, I, I respectfully uh, disagree with only that particular point that, uh, that we can't get people to watch and pay attention to financial literacy. I think that <clears throat> we have failed. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was not the first moral leader. He was also the, he was the first moral leader uh, who understood the value of marketing and framing an issue. And, and so Quincy Jones has told me, one of my mentors, Quincy Jones says it takes 20 years to change a culture. So I'm agreeing with you on the, this culture piece. Well, over the last 20 years, we've made dumb sexy. We've dumbed down and we've celebrated it. And what we've said now is over the next 20 years, we need to make smart sexy again. 
And so Quincy Jones, myself, and Andrew Young have come together, something called 5MK, 5 million kids, to, to break the back of the high school dropout generation and to make smart sexy again. So why kids dropping out of high school? Because they don't believe education is relevant to their future. How do you make it relevant? Show kids how to succeed, how to prosper, how to do well, even how to get rich legally. Uh, that's financial literacy, the language of money, free enterprise and capitalism, ownership, opportunity, and entrepreneurship. And all of a sudden now you got people glued to uh, education, focusing on what they want to learn, interested in math and science. We got, it, it is not the kids' fault. We're not, if the kids are our customers, we're not giving them a reason to be compelled. We got to reframe it, re, re, reshape it, and so Quincy and Tyrese and a bunch of celebrities are going to South Central LA next week to drop this 5MK initiative. Um, and part of it is a huge $100 million five-year media campaign to make smart sexy again. And the reframe, I mean, you know, Dr. Malvo has made being an economist sexy. Uh, so we can, we can do this, and I just refuse to accept that it's not possible rainbows after storms. Okay, I see so many different directions I wanted to go. I said, Harvey, I wanted to go to you, but then I wanted to talk to Dr. Malvo when uh, John was talking about kids. Um, yeah, I just wanted to Harvey respond. Lawrence, and then Dr. Can Malvo. Can I just jump in here since just, I was just uh, referenced? I, uh, excuse just, me, my brother. I'm just going to take that point of personal privilege and thank uh, okay. my brother John Hope for the work he does. John Hope, Brian, for the work he does, but also to say that I bring all of you greetings from Bennett College for Women. We are an oasis where we educate and celebrate women and develop them into 21st century leaders and global thinkers. And we do a financial literacy week every semester. We bring in experts, we have our seniors run their credit scores, we make sure that our young women are armed to go into the world fully prepared to deal with the fact that a credit score is what? Your adult report card. It is literally your adult report card. People will make judgments about you whether you're 620, 720, uh, those are the judgments that we make. This is such an important gathering, an important coming together. John, I think we can make financial literacy a media driver if we make it exciting. If we make it as exciting as it is in who's Zoom and who. I mean, how many people t went to a platform to find out somebody's business? We won't go into that. But, um, Somebody did. We could also say it's exciting. It's exciting to know that you can play in certain territories. Here's our challenge, though, folks. An educated African American is a dangerous person for a whole lot of people. Yep. So we need to invest in education. <clears throat> our HBCUs are the front line of our drama. There are 105 of us, but we're losing HBCUs every day. We need you. We need you to be our strong, passionate advocates. Mm -hmm. At Bennett College, we have a tiny, tiny $10 million endowment. But guess what? We've made HBCU history. I've been able to get a little money from the government, a little money. So we're going to break the first ground in 20 years on October 16th. All y'all come. On October 16th. And I'm real, real excited about that, but every HBCU is educating a young person that sometimes somebody threw away. And that's the tragedy. I have young women who come to us with a 2.3 GPA, couldn't get into somebody else's college, but they leave Bennett going to Harvard. How come? Because we do something there. There's something on the inside, and we take it to the outside, and we turn our young women into leaders. And so what I would ask all of you, and forgive me again, my brother, for jumping in, but like I said, my name gets called, I get excited. Um, <laughs> but I would ask all of you, if you don't, if you're not an HBCU grad, adopt one. I'd love it if it were Bennett, but if it were not, there's so many of us who are doing the Lord's work. And there's so many of our young people whose lives will be transformed because of this. There's money in the stimulus package that some of us are able to get a handle on, but guess what else? We had $85 million for two years that this administration has not continued. I love my President Barack Obama. I do not love the policy that says that HBCUs will not get this $85 million again. We need y'all to holler because we know that lobbying works. We need you to lift your voices and say, hook up the historically black colleges. And that's a and question that I think could be addressed to the second panel of policy experts, what you were saying about the $85 million that was not appropriated for the HBC. We, we, we right. need that money. You know, we have, um, why do we have HBCs? 
I'll tell y'all a funny story. It's not that funny, actually. I get on airplanes and uh, people ask you, you know, you sit in a plane, what do you do? I try that, I'm in, I'm in higher education. But every now and then they tease it out. And then I'm so glad that the Lord invented iPods because people will say things like, well, why do we still have HBCUs? So when they say that, I put my little rabbit ears and I go, <laughs> the music is too good, I just can't hear it. But people do not believe that we need HBCUs, but if we didn't have them, guess what? We would have to invent them because we take folk from who they are to who they're gonna be. And we do it in a different way. I know young people who graduate from Harvard who don't have anyone to write them recommendations. I don't know anybody who graduates from Bennett who can't walk in my office and get one from me or from the dean or from somebody else. That's what HBCUs do. But we black America have to embrace these colleges. And HBCUs and also PBIs, predominantly black institutions, a lot of which are community colleges. H that PBIs service. are community right. colleges, but, I, but let's just start with our... Because but let me, because you, we've got a lot of ground to cover, Dr. Malvo, and I hate having to cut you off, because I, I, I would love to hear you talk more about this. And I am going to circle back to the connection between education and the economy, but I did want to get Harvey Lawrence in here real quick before we move on talking about uh, the communities that you serve as president and CEO of the Brownville Corporation. <clears throat> yeah, um, you know, I think education is incredibly important. It's a gateway to one's future. I, I think fin financial literacy is something that is uh, woefully lacking overall in our community, um, not only the young folks, but with uh, many adults, because uh, we employ about 250 people, and many of them are entry level. They come in as entry level. And a large part of, of living is uh, in financial literacy is knowing what a budget is and knowing what, how you live within a budget and how you invest for the future. Now, in terms of education, we, um, you know, I work in a community that is, um, I guess, in financial uh, terms, an emergent community, meaning that it's a community that's on the, on, on the, on the rebound. Uh, we, uh, we operate, a, uh, as a community development corporation, we operated a health center, uh, several health centers. Uh, that has been our inroad in into economic development. But in addition to operating a health center, we also knew and, and saw in our community that uh, our youth were in uh, trouble. Um, there was always, uh, maybe every, once a month, some sort of youth-on-youth -youth violence that resulted either in a stabbing or a death. We had a school, a very, uh, an underperforming school, high school in our neighborhood, in which uh, we, because of what we saw happening with our, our students, we opened a, a, a school-based health center. We then later, actually, uh, when that school was subdivided into four school, we uh, wrote a planning grant and opened a, uh, a school, an actual high school, as a health center. And I think that's somewhat unique. It's a health-themed school. My point here, though, is that when the school, before it was subdivided, we had students uh, graduating at the rate of 35%. Now, I don't think that's unusual in many of our neighborhoods. Uh, this is a high school. And we essentially took the same population, the same students, and uh, we had our first graduating class, and the, the rate was up at 80%. Our valedictorian went on to Spelman, uh, the African American. He missed out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we had that valedictorian and some other students come back and work for us at the health center. Um, now, the point here that I'm making is that our kids, they can learn. Uh, it was a health themed school. They had internships in uh, major hospitals. The, the, what we did is that we enriched the environment, we gave them uh, experiential learning. And that is that it's not just the talk and the chalk and talk learning. Sometimes our young folks don't respond to that. You have to give them an experience that walks them through the learning process, walks them through what it means to, to develop and to be a professional. Because the suit and tie guys like myself are sometimes looked at as we don't know what's going on and we don't have much to offer them because for them, many of the times is just surviving, getting from home to school, and they're under tremendous peer pressure. So we provided an opportunity to see, to work with professionals in the healthcare uh, area, 
and to see that there are a whole range of things that were possible for them. But and that in terms motivated of, them. I'm sorry, so, in terms of funding, I know we've seen programs like that in Philadelphia that have taken a real nosedive over the past few years because of, because of the current uh, economic climate. How have you been able to, to fund these programs? A, one, we started out with a, um, it was a, what is called in New York City, a new vision school, which is a, a, a Bill and Melinda Gates a grant to actually get the process going. We wrote the, 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 uh, the planning grant, and we funded this, the school was funded through the Department of Education, and we have a person that's working with the school, uh, Director of Health uh, Programming. So the funding is actually coming out of New York City, but we were able to mold the school and to give a different feel, give a feel that we are, you know, we are one. We're responsible for you. And we think that you can learn, you can achieve. It's the same population. It's just the embrace of uh, encouragement, of saying that, uh, you know, it makes a big difference. I mean, we talk about money, and money is important. But the, the real deal, is, in my view, is where people start in terms of their confidence and whether they have support around them. In our community, there's always been, um, we've never had the money. And sometimes I think the money has made some funny things happen in our community in terms of us being responsible for each other. And, and looking out for each other. Uh, because we always had, in the bygone area, we ha uh, era, we had um, middle-income people living with low-income people. And so we were stratified by income. So now you have low concentration of low-income people, high, and middle-income people have options, so they, they're, they're elsewhere. Uh, so you had that sort of learning. So I think the, although funding is critical, I don't want to minimize that, but I think uh, so often I've seen organizations with money, but not with purpose. And, and the two, if you don't have the purpose, you don't have the mission, you don't have the drive that you want to be a change agent, then you pretty much are sort of churning over the same old stuff. And you know, my brother, with all due respect, if somebody handed me $100 million, it would fix a whole lot of things on my campus. I, it has become very popular for people to say that money is not important. Money is important. I don't see anybody at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, no. or Brown saying we don't need, mm -hmm. excuse my Ebonics, no money. So, you, no, no, no. I heard what you said, but I, it, it, we hear it an awful lot. Money is not going to fix everything. Yeah, it will fix a whole lot of things. The fact is that we need to begin to advocate for the same kind of funding that other people have. We, you know, spirit, we, we cannot hide behind spirit and say, well, if the spirit was right, the money would come. The money will come when we lobby for it, when we demand it, we get it. You know, I, I just really, yeah, right. point, point it's well one of those things that sticks in my car. Well it sounds like the audience me, wants to respond. Me, I want to respond and to that because I want to, the point that I'm making quickly, here. Harvey, only because I'd, I'd like to get Carol Brown in. I need to respond because I'm not, I am not at all saying that money is not important. What I am saying is that I've seen situations where people with less money, with the ability to have a purpose and, the, and, and a goal, come together <coughs> to make things happen. And I think money is, is very important. I think it is critical. But money without a purpose, without a goal, is, is, and we see it so often when we have... Okay, uh, uh, yeah, um, Harvey, we're running out of time. Yeah. Carol, I want you to weigh in, and then I actually have another question related to money, but not really in this vein. Go ahead, please. Dr. Malvo's financial literacy. Mm -hmm. I was one of those people as a managing director at Lehman Brothers that turned out the light at Lehman Brothers. When you look at the Recovery Act that's going on right now, there is such power in that act, but on the capital market side, when you talk about financial literacy, credit scoring, all that is important. But what is really as important is that we as a community understand the power that is in the Recovery Act and how we can take advantage of it and why there aren't more African Americans and people of color working in the capital markets and, and being a part of the recovery. There were people who were sitting at the table who were helping to formulate the Recovery Act so that they could take advantage and build their businesses up. I left Lehman Brothers, I am now at a minority-owned, the number one minority-owned financial service country, um, services 
uh, municipal finance company in the country, and people don't know us. And we should be taking advantage of that, building that, and so I'm inviting myself to your financial literacy <laughs> conference. Hey, you're, you are welcome to come. <laughs> about how we should be um, mobilizing and using the tax credit programs that are in the Recovery Act, not just for the investment in the community, but so that we can be a part of revitalizing the capital markets and that we can take the same advantage that the Goldman Sachs's of the world and the J.P. Morgan's of the world are taking in for revitalizing this economy. And so that's one of the powers that's in the act that the administration put in the act, and, we need, and I just needed to get that out there before we got back into <laughs> I'm, I'm, whether I'm, money is important, which it is. Which it is. Um, <laughs> it is. It no. is important. No. Let me follow up on that, because as Carol said, she's the managing director at Seaford, Bradford, and Shank, which is Senior the largest manager. Minority investment banking firm in the country. Muriel Siebert, I guess, was the first woman to be seated on the New York Stock Exchange. Muriel right? Siebert was the first woman to be seated on the st um, Stock Exchange. Suzanne Shank, Napoleon Bramford, and Muriel Siebert, minority um, and women-owned uh, investment bank that's in the top 10 of municipal finance <coughs> in the country. So we're competing with the Goldmans and the J.P. Morgans of the world. Top three in transportation finance and um, number one minority firm. And I left Lehman Brothers, well, didn't leave Lehman Brothers, Lehman but I Brothers left, left, um, you. Brothers left, left you. Lehman Brothers left me, but went from Wall Street to what is the new Wall Street. The new Wall Street has to encompass people of color. It has to encompass women. And if we don't take advantage of this opportunity to not only invest in our community, but to build up the next generation of financial stewards, then we are going to be left out of that dialogue But yet let me ask again. you about that, in particular the Recovery Act. The Treasury Department over the past few months seems like they've created all sorts of vehicles for the private sector. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of TARP. That's, right. that's certainly one that comes to mind. There have not been the same sort of vehicles created in the public sector. And, you know, access to cash and credit That's lines. actually not true. What, there are a lot of tax credit programs. Talk um, to us about that. The New that. Market What's Tax Credit Program is an old program. It's been around since um, 2000, but it was uh, bolstered mm -hmm. in the Recovery Act. And so that's direct investment in low and minority communities. Um, being from Chicago, one of um, our success stories is Bethel New Life, which took some new market tax credit money to build its center, and it's um, a transit-oriented development center, it is a community center, and so there are programs within the Recovery Act that are designed to invest in communities, create jobs, create economic development, but also um, financing programs that would, were supposed to jumpstart, and they have started to jumpstart with the Build America Bond Program, jumpstart the capital markets. And so you're seeing a lot of volume um, and a lot of movement in the capital markets and freeing up in the capital markets. It is a direct result of what um, the Obama administration did in passing the Recovery Act. And so the proceeds of that were designed to be invested in the community. And so um, I think it is a misnomer to state that because it wasn't it. just for the private sector, but Except, also for the public sector. You know, but we first got the first people to line up for recovery were bankers. Exactly. They were the first ones about a year ago who got that $700 billion on the basis of two little pieces of typing paper that Henry Paulson gave to President Bush. No footnotes, no justification, just we need $700 billion. The second piece, of course, was the Recovery Act that President Obama has dealt with, but it has not trickled down in the ways that we'd expect it. And I think that our community would miss an opportunity if not out of this CBC gathering, we didn't talk about a recovery that is targeted to the least and the left out. In other words, the unemployment rate officially is 9.7%. That means that for overall America, it's about 17%. One in six Americans does not have a job. What does that translate in our community to? One in three because our official unemployment rate is 15.7. When you adjust it, it's 28.7%. Yep. Yep. So, so what is the responsibility the, then? Let me just finish this point okay, real, really I, quickly. I also want to get in our other Be, Because I think that what, what we, we're looking at is a depression in our community. I mean, it's a recession. my, my it's brother a here says it's a reset. It's not a reset, it's a deset. I mean, we, you know, we have... Make sure it ain't a reboot. Make sure it's not a reboot. You know, you know I mean, and, and we have to deal with this. We have to deal with the fact that while the president is embroiled in his health care debate, my grandmama used to say, I don't mind, it's a devil's workshop. Yeah. See, all these crazy people going to these tea parties and stuff, they need some jobs. But we, if they had jobs, they would have, to, they would have time for all this devilment. But we need some jobs as well. 
And we need to begin to think about job recovery, job training programs, and that's something that's been missing from the tableau. Yeah. But, but George John, Burrell, would you yeah. like to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, 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 I am, as a person who spent a lot of their professional life in the public sector, I am fully supportive of supporting education and programs of opportunity. Uh, but I think that the challenge before us is really what we as a current business community, whether it's Siebert, whether it's PRWT, whether it's the other businesses here, how we figure out to take advantage of both the government programs but to compete in the private sector. If we don't figure out how to compete in the private sector, all of these young people that we're educating will have to fight the same battles that we fought to get where we are. If we will, if we will fight the battle, one of the things I'm most proud of, I spent six and a half years uh, in the government in the city of Philadelphia, and I was able to come out and go to work for an African-American company. There are lots of people who don't have that opportunity because they're not, one, our companies don't commit themselves enough to create those opportunities and people don't necessarily pursue them. But we've got to take advantage of the government programs. It is important that we do, that we figure them out, but we also must figure out how to compete in that private sector. I can't, it's not sexy. It's one of the things I've discovered over the last two and a half years as general counsel and executive vice president of a company, it's not sexy. People want to look under the hood. And if when they look under the hood, whether, it, it, you know, if, if they find things that are inappropriate, where they want to be discriminatory, you give them the reason for doing it. We must learn how to run our businesses effectively and efficiently. Jonathan, it seems like one of the opportunities certainly is in broadband. When you talk about broadband in this country, whether it's wireless or telephone, satellite, uh, certainly it's owned by the, the, by the private sector, but it's governed and regulated by the public. Should the, maybe the federal government get more involved in terms of uh, regulating, and, and should, it, should there be more of a push in terms of expansion for minorities in this area in broadband? Well, well, one part of the act, in fact, is to make sure everyone has access to broadband. That was primarily designed to take care of rural areas, but the fact is there are a number of African Americans, especially in South Carolina, North Carolina, in these rural areas, who will now have access to broadband. So that's all good. And in fact, I know of a number of African American entrepreneurs who have applied for and gotten grants to help build these out. I think it's important. But one of the best things about broadband, or let me just take it down to the internet, because we almost have two contrasts here. The $100 million project with Quincy Jones is great, but that's addressing the lower tier. This project, I mean, the fact that you said people don't know who your company is. I mean, that's an error on your part and the media's part. And you need to let us know who you are. But what we're forgetting in our conversations is the middle class. The middle class, in fact, exists now. They are suffering, probably in greater proportion than their counterparts, but they're the ones I could think can take real advantage of financial literacy just to take them from the college level to the graduate school level, and at the graduate school level is when you can take advantage of all these. That's why I went back and said it's really the internet or broadband that ought to be the platforms that supply this information because, and, and I'd love to get my fair share of your $100 million, <laughs> it's gonna be buried in with everything else that's on the TV screen no matter what the network you choose to put it on, but a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation online to people who have a real interest who have a real aptitude and in fact can exercise and grow a business is I think what the advantage. And let me just add one point here. Black businesses are crucially important to our survival. Black entrepreneurs hire black employees. Black entrepreneurs help build black wealth in our community. Black wealth in our community helps us invest in other corporations and, and, and eventually get a greater share in how they're operated. So uh, again, it's don't look at us as one, as one single solution. There are multiple solutions and we need to be working at all levels. 